I love the way the First Gen Lounge makes me feel. Because it creates a space where I belong, where we're able to create community. The fact that it's a community. It's a safe place. It also gives me a place to understand different perspectives. The stories of these individuals prescribe transformational perspective. I receive encouragement, enlightenment, empowerment. And also serve as a catalyst to just keep going. Where we're able to be our true selves. I'm allowed to be an unapologetic first gen. And above all else, tell our story. And every episode is unique. I love it. I'm your host, Dr. Eve, and I'd like to welcome you to the First Gen Lounge. All right, First Gen fam, it is your favorite day of the week. It's Thursday. Y'all gonna be sick of me saying it, but it's cool because you already know what it is. But I am here today with the really good friend, uh, a good brother, a good brother. You'll find out why he's a good brother. Dr. Rodney D. Smith, who is a two-time HBCU graduate and just an all-around awesome person. Dr. Smith, welcome to the First Gen Lounge. So happy to have you today. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be a part of your endeavors. I am glad. Look, I am so happy to have you. I um, I know I told you this before, but I'm going to tell all the people, the, the guy on this podcast today is a stand-up guy. Dr. Smith is awesome, and he's so genuine. Somebody I met uh, about three about three years ago, maybe? Um, yeah, it's been about three years. Uh, when I was at Shaw, when I was at Shaw, and it's just been really good to stay connected and to see you know, the growth for both of us, especially with you becoming a, a published author with the, you know your book, and we're going to talk about all of that. But I'm about to spill the beans. I want you to spill the beans. So tell the people who you <laughs> are and what you do. Okay. I'm Rodney Smith. And uh, originally, my family originates from South Carolina, but I was born in Philadelphia, and my dad didn't want to raise us in Philadelphia. And so he moved us back down to South Carolina, Georgetown, South Carolina, to be exact. So I grew up uh, in the low country of South Carolina on the coast and uh, ended up going to Morris Brown College as an undergraduate in Atlanta, Georgia. Stayed in Atlanta for close to 10 years, including the years I was in school there as an undergraduate student. And then after nine years, close to 10 years, I left Atlanta and went to Nashville, Tennessee. I was working at Fisk University at the time in the Office of Admissions. Um, and then I decided to, at that point, to go back and get a master's degree. The funny story is, or interestingly enough, my undergrad degree is in architecture, but all of my graduate degrees are in education, uh, mm. education, administration, and supervision, as well as curriculum design. Funny story is, I remember having a conversation with my dad when I was coming out of high school and asking my dad, dad, what area do you think I should get into? And he said, son, I think you should get into education or politics. And I was like, dad, no, neither. I'm not doing <laughs> education or politics. I was like, politics, do you think I'm corrupt? He was like, no, son, politics has become corrupt. But the true politics is to engage with fellow man, hmm. to be concerned about your community, be concerned about your family, be concerned about, you know, your people. That's what true politics is about. So he was like, but I ignored my dad's advice and went into architecture, worked at an architecture firm in Atlanta just before the Olympics came to Atlanta. Great experience. But what I also discovered is sitting behind a drafting board or behind an AutoCAD screen, it completely bored me out of my mind. <laughs> hmm. I'm a people person. I like to engage with people. So being behind a computer screen or a drafting board didn't suit my personality type. But... You know, I often say, you know, there's this notion that an architect is a master builder. And so the education piece comes in. And I like to believe now that as an educator, I'm a master builder of people. Mm. So I think I, I think I, I think I still use some of the foundations of architecture, if you will. Because, I mean, we know, we know, understand, we understand in architecture, you have to put a foundation in first, right? Anything that you build, anything that you're going to erect as a building project, you have to put a foundation in first. And whatever that foundation is, of course, becomes what it is, the foundation upon which you will build this thing. And so it is important that we build people with good foundations first before we begin to try to create people. So I've, I've sort of stolen some of my architecture background and now move that over to what I do in education. So uh, for the past 22 years, 
I've been working in education, higher education in particular, from student affairs to enrollment management. I started enrollment management, in fact, to development, fundraising in universities, and then, of course, in the classroom. That's probably where I, I have the most fun, if you will. I always want to be in the classroom in some capacity because it helps me stay intact. I like to call it my uh, scholar identity and to see myself as a scholar. So being in the classroom helps me to stay in touch with that part of my identity. Mm. That's a little bit about me. So if you don't mind, you know, I, I know a little bit about you having your business that you moved into full time. Is that right? Right. Thanks. Congratulations. Thank you. Big move. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So in addition to being in the higher education world, a lot of my time lately have been spent doing some consulting out in the community. I do a lot of work, particularly in around this idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I've been doing some training simply because of my background in the higher education world. Though my advanced degrees are in higher education administration, curriculum and instruction, a lot of my personal research delved into particularly the African-American community. So sort of the sociology, if you will, of education is a lot of what I think about on a personal level. And then it's sort of dovetailed into my professional world. So I was doing a lot of consulting in the community, again, in and around this idea of diversity and inclusion. I read everything that I can get my hands on with regard to the subject matter because it's near and dear and important to me. I live it. And now as a result of living it, I, I now also get a chance to try to help others wrap their minds around this idea of diversity, equity, inclusion. I teach courses at the university. In fact, this semester I'm teaching a course called Racial and Ethnic Diversity and Cultural Understanding at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, a graduate mm. level course. And I've been teaching that course for the past, let's see, four years, five years. So they asked me to come in and teach that course. And it's something that has become something that's near and dear to my heart. It's very important to me. In fact, I, I, I often say that I've committed myself to this work for the rest of my life. A big part of my studies and the research that I found was I uh, came across a gentleman by the name of William Cross who did this research some time ago, I want to say back in the 70s, definitely mm -hmm. the 80s, about identity development, particularly of the African American community. And he calls it the five stages of negrescence. But the final stage is a, a commitment stage, a internalization stage. And so mm -hmm. I really believe that I've reached that stage, this internalization stage, this commitment stage, committed to my community. Now, yeah, of course, I'm open to relationships outside of the African-American community. But similar to our sister, Toni Morrison, I've heard her say on multiple occasions in multiple interviews that I am most concerned about the viewpoints, the perspective, the, the progress of the African-American community. So the, the company that my wife and I started called Sofix Solutions was birthed out of the work that we do in the community with regard to diversity, equity, inclusion consulting. And so I, but even Sofic is not a very common word. Mm -hmm. When we were trying to think of a name for our organization, we were just kind of sitting in our TV room, you know, what are we going to call our company? And of course, uh, with education in itself, with the English language having its origins in Latin, we found this word, Sofic has Latin origins, of course, which means skilled, a clever, hmm. or wise. And so that's the word that we we settled on. So because it meant wise, wise solutions, wise advice, wise consultation to individuals. So the name Sophic Solutions emerged as our company's name. And so I've been working on this full time for the past three months. Mm -hmm. But we've been doing part time work really since 2007. The company was birthed back when we were living in Nashville. We both were in graduate school, in fact. My wife was at the University of Tennessee and the College of Social Work, and I was at Tennessee State University and the School of Education. So we were doing this work for the community. So that's that's what I'm working on right now. In addition to, yeah, I'm a writer. I, of course, you mentioned that uh, I published my first book about two years ago. Oh, um, yeah, called, yeah. Yeah, about... Uh, uh, the title of it is, Are We Really Crabs in a Barrel? 
The subtitle is The Truth and Other Insights About the African American Community. So having grown up on the coast of Carolina, I had an opportunity to have some experience dealing with crabs. I'm talking about the marine life. I'm talking about I'm talking <laughs> I'm talking about the crabs that we eat on our dinner table. Oh, yeah. Um, because I think th- th- there's a comparison. I'll, I'll, I'm sure, I'm going on a limb, I'm sure that you've heard it in the African-American community. We sometimes say, oh, we're just crabs in a barrel. We're pulling mm-hmm. each other down. We're in this barrel. We're pulling each other down. One one crab is attempting to escape the barrel, and one, another crab will clamp onto that crab and pull him back down into the barrel. And I always took issue with that analogy even from a small kid, because I remember seeing those crabs going from that barrel to a boiling pot of water. Mm. It, right? It, so it so the, the, the barrel from the barrel to the boiling pot of water, all of it represented certain death. Mm. So the question, the question that we never ask when we make that analogy or that comparison is how did the crabs get in the barrel? Mm-hmm. Crabs don't live in barrels. Right. Mm -hmm. Because I know I'm not a marine biologist, but I know I did a little study of crabs because I've been troubled by this analogy in my entire life. So I know crabs in their natural environment, they clamp onto each other for protection. They clamp onto each other to catch food. They clamp onto each other to withstand the current in the ocean. Mm -hmm. In fact, spider crabs, spider crabs, when they're disposing of their shell, they will cover each other to protect each other from predators, those that are exposed because their shell hasn't grown back yet. Mm. They live in community. They live in community. In fact, you know, one of my favorite new shows on TV now, you know, the reality TV is Deadliest Catch. When when you Mm. watch that show, they don't catch crabs one at a time. They catch crabs in community. What I believe is happening, what I believe is happening is when that that net is scraping against the ocean's floor. Those crabs are saying, there's danger, something is happening, unusual, we need to stick together in community. Mm. So, now back to this this analogy about crabs in a barrel. So what if, when that crab is reaching the rim of that barrel, or the rim of that pot, what if the other crab is clamping on to him in an, in an effort to make this crab chain, this crab link, to get all the crabs out, but the, the challenge is, the, the escaping crab at the rim had not anchored himself yet on the anchor of the barrel and there the other crab was pulling him down or the other crab could be saying hey this is unusual environment we probably need to stick together so you need to get back in here with us they don't know they're about to go into a boiling pot of water we're putting these human ideas on the crabs we're assuming that the crabs know that we're about to consume them They're just in an unnatural environment for them. So how do we compare that to the African-American community? Well, unfortunately, I've noticed in lots of communities, lots of cities around the country, African-American communities are poor and destitute by design. Mm. Could it be akin to, analogous to a barrel? And people are doing unnatural things because they're in an unnatural environment. I think that we've mischaracterized crabs and we mischaracterized the humans who get compared to those crabs. So that's a project that I just completed two years ago and then I have another uh, writing project that I'm just getting started with, formulating my ideas and thoughts around uh, African-American fatherhood. Mm. Um, My father is probably the example that I will start with of being the consummate father, the epitome of fatherhood, not mm-hmm. just my father in the in the neighborhood I grew up in back in South Carolina, but he was the neighborhood's father. Mm. He he is the guy to this day, he's seventy seven years old, but he's still the guy to this day that my friends will call me if they've lost contact with my dad or don't have his current number, anything it's like, Hey man, I need to talk to your dad. They they didn't call they're not calling to talk to me. They call him to get my dad's number so they can talk to my dad because he's just mm-hmm. been that kind of a father for our community in particular. In fact, when my female relatives, when their fathers are not available or around, my dad is the one who's who's walking everyone down the aisle when they get married. Oh, wow. Yeah. He was the guy that the whole neighborhood piled into the car when we were kids. 
to go to, to Park One football and to Little League Baseball. And he was mm. never a coach, but he always volunteered and got the a volunteer coaches award at the end of the year. Oh wow. And I believe I believe that that is indicative of a lot of African American fathers in this country. There's research, there's tons of research that supports this. In mm-hmm. fact, I put some of that in the book, Are We Really Crabs in a Barrel? And so I thought maybe in the, my next writing project, I will expand upon that particular section of the book and talk about Black fatherhood. So that's what I'm working on right now. Well, you are busy. <laughs> you are really <laughs> busy. And that's, and that's not a bad thing because you are, like you said, you are an architect by by design as well. And so the fact that you want to constantly build and improve and you have this vision, uh, I think you, to be an architect, you have to have a vision. You have to be a visionary. So I love that you're moving in your space. And even so, that as now a full-time entrepreneur, you have the space, the creative space to do all the things that you know that you're here to do. I'm really yeah. loving that. You said a lot of things, and I want to tap into a few of those things. You talked about your business being Sophic and a part of Sophic being wise. I want to touch on wisdom a little bit. Imagine... You know, going back to when you first graduated from college, you know, fresh out of Morris Brown, HBCU graduate in Atlanta, you know, you're in Atlanta. Come on now. What do you wish someone would have told you about all the years ahead of you? What do you wish somebody would have told you about life? That you don't have to have it all figured out right now. Mm -hmm. That, you know, a lot of times before we get started on projects, we think that we have to have it figured out before we get started on it. I mean, I I have an appreciation for having the end in mind when you start a Mm -hmm. project, yes. But you don't have to have it all figured out. Even even going to college, having to have declared a major. A lot of times we feel like we have to declare a major when we hit the door, when we hit the, Mm -hmm. the steps of our colleges and universities. I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to believe as in higher education professional for the past 22 years, I realize now that that is not exactly true. Because mm-hmm. um, college is the place in American society, among other institutions. So there's no real demarcation in America from childhood to adulthood. There's no, mm-hmm. there's no rites of passage, universal rites of passage program. The closest thing that we have is college, university settings. And we often say our students are going away to college to find themselves. So mm-hmm. if you're finding yourself, how do you, why do you feel like you have to have it figured out when you get there? A part of finding yourself is figuring it out when you get there. So a lot of times I think people chase these rabbit holes, go go down these rabbit holes, chasing these ideas or these dreams that they hadn't fleshed out, they hadn't thought through. They're somebody else's dream, somebody else's idea for their life. And so if we would allow students truly the opportunity to find themselves on college campuses and, and not pressure them to make them feel like they're forced to have to declare a major as soon as they hit the door. Because a lot of times, again, we're off chasing something that is not necessarily our calling. Mm. Um, Why do you say that? Well, because look at me for an example. Like I mentioned to you earlier that my undergrad degree is in architecture. I often tell people that though I learned from that and I still use it in some regards, the architecture piece was a selfish dream for me Hmm. and the education piece is about collectivity is about community is about us in the in the whole as opposed Hmm. to me just looking out for me i often tell people the architecture thing that i did was for me education is for we Hmm. i don't think it was central to my calling because now for the past 22 years that i've been working in higher education it doesn't feel much like work Mm mm-hmm I don't struggle to do it. It doesn't cause, you know, of course, every day is not the best day. But, you know, I've learned also in this higher education world that, you know, this may sound a bit foolish, but this is what I believe. There are no bad days. Hmm. Some days are better than others. I'm still looking for my best day. But there's no such thing as a bad day. No such thing as a bad day. I like that. You know, in education, you're getting a chance to, you know, contribute to another person's life. 
So mm-hmm. I'm a fan of that, that moment. <laughs> You know, so I don't know. It may sound a bit foolish and a bit out there, kind of abstract, esoteric. I don't know. <laughs> <But>. <laughs> no, I'm I'm with it. I, I follow. I, I like that a lot. And you also touched on something earlier that I I hadn't. I've never had anybody break it down in the way that you did with the crabs in the barrel. So I'm looking forward to digging into your book and, and learning more because the idea of protecting each other and pulling each other apart. We only got part of the story growing up about the crabs in the, in the barrel. And it yeah. reminds me of, you know, the reason that this podcast exists. It's about the community and the pooling and the, and the, protecting and the helping in the community um so I, I love how you were able to break that down for us and help us to reconceptualize something that can be often seen as so negative because even sometimes being first generation there's some negative stereotypes that you know there's unmotivation there that we don't have direction <laughs> you know which Honestly, we may lack direction, but that doesn't mean that we don't have drive and determination to be able to do well. And even so, right. to be lifted in the right community, like that was a powerful, powerful analogy. Being in the right community is what helps us along the way, what helps us, you know, in the deep waters when, when it's dark. Like, man, you took me there. You took me there with that. I, I'm loving that. Y'all need to get this book. <laughs> like, seriously, y'all need, y'all need to get this. And it just reconceptualize even the blackness and the racism that we we get these stereotypes right put on us sometimes that's exactly right you, you, you own them. you're hitting the nail squarely on the head i think you know as a result of my work you know studying this idea of diversity equity inclusion i now know analogies like that when we say black folk could just not supportive of each other we're just pulling each other down saying those kinds of things mm-hmm. that is known as internalized racial oppression Mm. with internalized racial oppression where we accept these bad notions about ourselves i remember being in the classroom some time ago and having one of these conversations about the african-american community talking to one of my african-american students a female student and she said you know dr smith I hate black people. And I said, you got to think a little bit broader than that. You got to understand how that sounds when I hear that. It sounds like to me, when you said that, it sounds like you said, I hate myself Hmm. because because you're black. Right. Yeah. If if you're black and you say that you hate black people, that sound to me, it sounded like she said, I hate myself. And so again, Hmm. that's a form of, this internalized racial oppression based on the fact that we are socialized in a racialized society Mm. and let's be honest there are two bookends to this racial conversation in america one end is white one end is black and then Mm. unfortunately everybody else is in the middle so they're opposing each other and so we we sometimes adopt and because you know we we spend a lot of time in america talking about what what a racist is not but we don't talk enough about what a racist is Hmm. we often equate racism to these individual acts of hate towards an individual or towards a group of people yes that is racism that is i believe an extreme form of racism i would say that that's hate mongering So, you know, often when we say, you know, you're a racist and people say, oh, no, I'm not a racist. What they mean is, no, I'm not a hate monger. They don't go around hating on people. They don't go around using the N word. They don't go around hurting people intentionally. They don't want to see black people hanging from trees. Mm hmm. But yet and still, we've we had multiple research projects that showed that people make decisions based on race. There's a famous research project that was out a few years ago. I think it was 2004, 2005, and they had these resumes and they sent them out. They're generic resumes, all the same qualification. They sent them out to potential jobs or companies that would be hiring people. They put four names on these applications on these resumes one name was for the female side was emily and lakeisha then on the male side it was greg and jamal 50 percent of the time Mm. greg and emily got a call back where lakeisha and jamal didn't get a call back and we would suggest those people who made that decision to call emily and greg back they're not racist because they're not hate mongers 
they not trying they're not trying to hurt anybody they don't want to see people hanging from trees they don't go into into churches and shoot people gun people down but mm-hmm. they still made decisions because they were black sounding names versus white sounding names so what is it then if it's not racism so we've done a poor job of evaluating ourselves in this notion of racism in America so we believe that the country is made up of two groups of people, those who are racist and those who are not. I think that that is an error, that this idea of racism happens. We have moments of growth, then we have moments of setback. We have moments of acceptance, we have moments of denial. It's not a linear concept with an either or. You know, Dr. Robin D'Angelo would say, this good bad binary we have to get out of this good bad binary because if somebody says that i'm a racist that they're saying that i'm a bad person no you're not a bad person but you've been socialized in a a racialized society Hmm. so we have to we have to start thinking about that differently you know where me i'm walking down the street in nashville my wife and i just had an a nice evening dinner and I'm walking toward my car and I see this young brother in a hoodie walking toward us and I tense up thinking that he's about to assault us in some way. You know, I put my keys through my knuckles. I'm bracing for the altercation. He pops his head up in the hoodie. Good evening, ma'am, sir. Unusually cold weather we have, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> right? So why did I think that this young brother, young plus Black plus male equals criminal. Why did I think that I'm a black man? Mm -hmm. Because I've been socialized in a racialized society. We see it on the media. I'm not exempt from that. No one is exempt from that. And so we buy into these notions, these stereotypes, like you said earlier, we buy into these stereotypes about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Therein lies the internalized racial oppression. Or that young lady that I had in my classroom to say, you know, Dr. Smith, I hate black people. Or we say black people just don't support each other we're just crabs in a barrel pulling each other down but the truth of the matter is we wouldn't have survived if it weren't for other black people that's how we survive in this country my great-grandmother quick story my great-grandmother in south carolina she's on she's dead and gone now but when i was a kid she used to always keep a cooked pot of rice on the back of the stove hmm. i was like grandma why do you always have a cooked pot of rice on the back of the stove she said, in case somebody comes by who's hungry. Hmm. <laughs> because that's how we were able to survive. Think of, I mean, I'm not saying anything that you don't know. I mean, because that's how we've that's how we've been able to survive in America is through community. We are yes. very communal people. And yes. so I, I really take issue when we say that we're not. Because we've been able to. I mean, I come from two historically black colleges. I mean, you know. <laughs> Some of the greatest minds, some of the greatest Americans, oh, I believe, arguably, the greatest American that the country ever created, that ever produced, came from a historic black college, Dr. Martin Luther King. Mm. There there are people that would argue with me about that, but I mean, I, I I, I would debate them that say that this man, so who else would be the greatest American this country ever produced other than him? I mean, you go to Washington, D.C., and there are monuments all over the city that most of them are dedicated to the country's founding fathers. And then this little preacher from Alabama. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a president. He wasn't a senator. He wasn't, I mean, that's the indication how, how great the man was. Absolutely. And he came. Yeah. But anyway, I know I'm rambling. (laughs) So no, you're passionate. That's what I say. And it's interesting how you make the connections to things and again it's your work is your work so even how you go back to one of the greatest figures to have ever walked this earth you definitely absolutely he's definitely somebody who's all about diversity and inclusion and, and equity and and those things for which you stand as well so it only like oh everything aligns like that just makes sense and like i said with yeah. hbcu graduate hbcu graduate yeah I lo- hey you know i'm an hbcu graduate so i love it i absolutely love it i'm curious to know you know, as you are a first generation college graduate, you are an author, you are a father, you are a doctor, you are a higher education professional, you are many things, entrepreneur. What are three things that you believe has helped you, especially as a first generation college graduate, to be successful? Well, three things. Wow. Yeah, that's a good question. I think overarchingly, the, the number one thing I, I think, as I'm sitting here just kind of thinking off the top of my head, is a believing in yourself mm. but that 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 happens I, I think it happens a couple of ways but most of the time it happens through 
a, in some regards, a vicarious experience or through somebody somebody saying it to you, believing in you mm. before you started believing in yourself. What I mean by that, okay, I, uh, I played football in high school and I was a quarterback. And I remember my first year playing junior varsity football. I was in the eighth grade and I was the third string quarterback on the offensive side, but I was first string on defense. I was a defensive back. And so I played all the time in the game and then we were beating this team really good. And the offense was on the field. My coach looked at me and said, get in the game, Smitty. And I said, coach, Offense is on the field. I play defense. Yeah, I know I'm a third string quarterback. He said, get in the game and play the position that you practice. And I said, I'm shaking in my boots. And he grabbed me. He said, you practice, don't you? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, get in the game and execute. Hmm. So he was believing in me that I can do this thing. I wasn't believing in myself. He was believing in that I can do it. But I was scared, shaking in my cleats that I couldn't do it. And the, the point I'm making is, you know, two years later, I was the starting quarterback at my high school and on varsity team. I went to a pretty big high school in South Carolina for a high school, 2,000 students. I'm 5'8", 150 pounds, soaking wet with bricks in my pocket. But coach, <laughs> coach believed in me. And so it, it caused me to start believing in myself. After you go in there and you start executing what you practice, it starts working for you. You call a play and the play works. He's like, whoa, I can do this. So what I've learned about success, you have to have someone, this, uh, I call it an academic term, controlled motivation. Controlled motivation means someone else is motivating you until it transfers to intrinsic motivation. That's hmm. what happens to most of us. Somewhere along the line, controlled motivation. I mean, yeah, I used to run a youth development program. I can hear some of the young men saying, you know, I asked them the question, who made you come to these sessions that we have? It's like, my mama made me come. But before long, I wanted to come because you, you, you see what I'm saying? The transfer took place along the way where somebody's making you do it and then sooner or later you make yourself do it. So it goes from a controlled motivation to an intrinsic motivation. Those are some of the keys to success. In other words, you gotta have people concerned about you. You gotta have caring adults around you who believe in you, who mentor you, who bring you along, and you cannot forget to do the same thing. Mm. When you get in these positions of influence and positions of power, you, you cannot you cannot forget to do the same. Because mm. again, we survived that way, particularly Absolutely. the African American community. We, I mean, historically, black college is based on that premise, I believe, of you know this this controlled motivation until it becomes an intrinsic motivation. You know, you you had those teachers that just was not having it. They were like, "Look, you're gonna do what I ask you to do. You're gonna do what I tell you to do," <laughs> and you did it. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's why we have that kind of love and respect for our teachers particularly in the in the african-american community absolutely because yeah uh, they, they take I on the mother and father like roles yeah they sure so, do those are some of the i don't know if that was three but those are some of the they weave in there they weave in there they weave in there well look, we have gotten to a point where we are you know going to wrap up for sure and i have to ask you just one one final question it's the question that i ask everybody i just gotta know if there's one thing you could leave the family with one thing that you could tell everybody to hold on to for life what would that one thing be yeah i think i've been saying it all along in, in my study and i've come across a couple of words that are very impactful to me and one one of the words that i'm going to share with you right now is a south african word it is ubuntu hmm. and if i remember the right correctly the spelling is u b u n t u which my understanding of the translation of this south african word is i am because we are that's my understanding of what that word means. I believe I've learned that it, it's a Zulu word. There are a couple other Zulu words that really resonates with me, but that that's one of them that really resonates with me. That I am because we are. Mm. You know, a lot of times we hear people say, oh, this gentleman and that this lady is a self-made person, a self-made man, self-made woman. That's impossible. That's mm -hmm. an oxymoron. 
That cannot happen. People need people. Absolutely. Don't, don't ever forget that. And, you know, sometimes we get tunnel visioned into believing that I got to do for me, I got to do for me. But we won't get anywhere if we don't do for we. <laughs> we have to do for each other. I believe that. I will go to my grave with that idea that community is the most important thing. Hmm. If, if I get, the, if yes, I get there and I don't bring any, yeah, if I get there and I don't bring anybody else along, then what's the use of me getting there? You know, there is none. <laughs> there is none. <laughs> there is no use. No, there, there is, is no use. Who are you going to share it with? I mean, who are you going to, you're going to want to share this with somebody. So you got to have mm-hmm. family. You got to, you got to lift, you got to lift as you climb. That's, and I know the bros who are listening, <laughs> that would resonate with them. Brothers of Omega Sound Five Fraternity Incorporated. But would <laughs> I was say, yeah, I was, I was gonna actually tell them why you are, you know, a good brother. But since you told them, yeah, yeah, uh, that there it is. But now they know. <laughs> yeah, we can't forget that. about those who are coming behind us. That's so. That's never my final thought. Never. Never. Well, you have been an absolute joy to have, and your wisdom, your knowledge mic drop bombs <laughs> you really do and you know i love i love your love for us for us as black people to push us forward um even for you to be a two-time hbcu graduate not not are you saying you love us but even in your youth to practice that and to recognize it as you you know continue to grow and just really to be in the embodiment of what it is to be a black man, to be a proud black person, somebody pushing the culture forward, but not just that getting other people to have an appreciation forward or at least to be open to what it is that that is in the world that we we have to live in. You know, not that you force anything down anybody's throat, but just to truly have an appreciation for it. And if not an appreciation, at the very least, a respect. Um, I can yeah. definitely dig that. So if you can um, tell us really quickly where on the internet we can find you so we can keep connecting to you that would be awesome that was well said sister oh by the way that was well said oh. yes I <laughs> thank you like i'm over here yeah, I'm, just, I'm a processor so i'm like man this is he- it's heavy it's heavy i do love us i do love us so yeah so individual can find me my website is sophic solutions group dot com and sophic is spelled s o p h i c solutionsgroup.com and you'll find us there and then my book are we really crabs in a barrel is on amazon you can find it and so you can find a paperback or you can find the kindle version on on amazon as well and then i'm on all of the social medias which i'm always challenged to tell you my handles on social media <laughs> So I got to look it up. I know Twitter is Dr. Rodney Smith one, I believe. I'm going to check that in a second. Yes. At Dr. Rodney Smith one. Yep. That is it. And on Instagram, I am Dr. Rodney D. Smith. That's my handle on Instagram. And awesome. on Facebook, I, I have a page for my book. It's just titled, uh, Are We Crabs? At Are We Crabs? So you can find me on Facebook that way, too. Awesome. Well, those are my oh. ways, to, to, yeah, ways to connect. Ways to connect, ways to find you on the Internet. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm available for speaking engagements. I'm particularly interested in doing Black History Month engagement. So if you're, if, as you're planning your Black History programs, consider me. Consider me to bring me, you know, to come and share with you and share with community. Yeah. So at the risk of self-promotion. <laughs> <laughs> at the, hey, as the kids business. say, throwing the plug, throwing the plug. Do what y'all do. <laughs> Handle your business. I ain't mad. <laughs> That's what it's for. I mean, to be for real, you know, you put yourself on. Well, look, again, I definitely appreciate you, my friend, for being on. Um, wishing you nothing but the very best and all that lies ahead. Continue to press forward and knowing that everything that you do is absolutely appreciated and definitely needed. Because if you weren't out there, you know. I mean, really, the perspective that you're giving today, like, my gosh, um, we wouldn't have it. And that's what makes the work that you do and the life that you live so valuable. Thank you again for your time. Have a great day. Well, great evening now. Thank you. Proud of you, my sister. Keep doing it. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you.